What about atomics? You might have learned about atomics in a previous concurrency course, and really, when we're talking about appropriate use of locks, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about this. And we start from the question of, well, what if we could find a way to get rid of locks and waiting altogether? That would avoid the lock convoy problem, but also avoid any potential for deadlock, starvation, etc. Uh, and in a previous course, you might have learned about test and set and maybe compare and swap. And those are atomic operations supported through hardware. Uh, and they are uninterruptible and therefore either completely succeed or it's as if they didn't run at all. And is there a way that we could use these sorts of indivisible operations? Yeah, sometimes that's really all we need. If we're just adding a number to a counter or something, all we need is for that to be atomic. We don't actually require you know, any sort of acquiring locks or uh, releasing locks or any kind of behavior like that because all that matters is that the read, modify, write for the you know, X++ plus plus is atomic. That's, that's all it is. Uh, and so the thing that we want to remember is atomic operations are indivisible. Uh, other threads can see state before or after the operation, and they cannot see any intermediate state, nothing in between. And similarly, in a read-modify-write uh, operation, then the read and write happen as a package. So you can't read the value as 4, and then you want to increment it, so increase it to 5. But in the meantime, somebody swoops in and sets it to 0. You, you don't want that. Uh, and if it's atomic, that won't happen. Uh, and so the thing in Rust is that you specify the ordering that you want for atomics. Uh, use the default, which is ordering sequential consistency, SEQ, CST. Uh, and uh, in, in big red text, I warn you here, don't use relaxed atomics unless you're an expert. Later in the course, we're going to talk about the concept of memory consistency. It's just a, a couple of lectures away. Uh, and we'll talk about different reorderings and what have you. But um, so you don't get surprises, sequential consistency is the one that you want. Uh, please, for now, just take my word for it that this is what you are supposed to use, uh, and we'll come to a definition of sequential consistency as well as discuss the alternatives when we get there. Uh, and uh, this disapproving bird will give you its look of disapproval uh, if you should try to use relaxed atomics. Don't cross the disapproving bird. That's my advice. Don't cross it. Look how mad that bird is. Don't make it mad. Okay. We know atomic operations are indivisible. Uh, and in Rust, there exists language support for uh, atomic types. You specify, for example, it is an atomic bool, and that is the type that we are working with. Uh, creating a separate type for an atomic number uh, or an atomic boolean or any other such thing makes it a lot harder to make a mistake because we can't just directly assign or read a value. We're forced to use the actual methods that are associated with that type. Uh, and so you don't end up accidentally saying, oh, I, I didn't know that this was atomic or I, I forgot it was supposed to be or anything like that. Um, and the functions that are used to get and set the value are load and store. Uh, and so every time you want to set the operation, you want to get the value, uh, then you specify in the store case what you are storing and the ordering that you want this operation to take place in. As said before, always sequential consistency. Don't make the bird mad. Uh, and then there is load where you just specify the ordering of sequential consistency. So that is how we do it. There is no assignment operator, uh, and those are used to make sure that you do it correctly. Um, and with atomics, there are three kinds of operation, as I've previously mentioned. Um, there is a read, which is use load. There is a write, which is use store. And then there's the read, modify, write instructions. And you know, that is what you would use to cover the you know, in incrementing a counter, count plus plus kind of thing. Uh, because, well, in Rust, we would use an appropriate function. Uh, it is fetch underscore add, and you would say the value that you want to add, one. And then, once again, you specify ordering, sequential consistency. So fetch add is the example for atomically increasing the variable's value. Uh, and uh, you specify 
exactly how much you want to add in the ordering, and that gets the job done. It is maybe a little tedious to repeat the ordering every single time, uh, but it is necessary in Rust, and that's how we do it. Uh, there's also fetch sub, fetch max, fetch min, and then bitwise operations like and and nand or an xor, but I think we can just breeze past those because they are analogous to the idea of uh, the fetch and add. Uh, where we are going to actually um, just instead of add, subtract, or figure out which is the max between these two values, all straightforward. Uh, the other thing that I want to mention is the uh, compare and swap uh, operation. Uh, depending on what previous course you've taken, we might have covered compare and swap, we might have not. Uh, if you've taken EC254, it wasn't really in there. It might have appeared on an exam question, uh, which either was an exam you wrote or you saw as a previous exam question, but uh, it was something we skipped over. Uh, if you took a different course, uh, I don't know if it was covered at all, so let's be safe and spend a minute to talk about it. Um, and compare and exchange on the x86 architecture is the CMP XCHG instruction, uh, and it is used to actually do a uh, comparison of two values and then possibly change it if the expected value is the same as, uh, what, as what we were thinking it's going to be. Uh, so um, here I've described it using C. Uh, I want to emphasize the fact that it's not actually implemented in C, and this is a hardware instruction. I am just describing it using C because using program code is precise and compact. If I try to explain using the English language, it ends up several paragraphs, and English is imprecise. Uh, this is why uh, legal contracts are full of many words and they have lots of definitions up at the beginning of them. It's because English as a language is imprecise and therefore a very precise definition for every term has to be given so that there is no possibility of confusion about what somebody means uh, or possibility that later a court will interpret a word to mean a thing that was different from what a party writing this contract or signing this contract intended it to be. So compare and swap, uh, given a value, check it, see if it's the same as the old value, that is, is it the expected value. If it is, we can set the new value, uh, and otherwise uh, we don't do that. Uh, and either way, we return the old value that we read. So you check if it returned the value you were expecting. If it did, you know you changed it. If not, then you know what the new expected value would be, and you try again. Uh, and the Rust equivalent for that is compare and swap. It takes as parameters the expected old value, the desired new value, and the ordering, uh, and we'll see an example. Um, and here is using compare and swap to uh, implement a spin lock. So we declare a lock as an atomic bool, uh, and then uh, we use the compare and swap from false to true uh, with sequential consistency. Uh, and if we get back false, it means the lock was unlocked. Uh, and in that case, we can uh, you know, break out of that loop uh, because the while loop condition will evaluate to false, so we can leave. Uh, and if uh, we are actually wrong and uh, you know, we, we were not successful in, uh, in locking it, uh, then, well, we have the spin loop hint code. Uh, what does this function do? Well, it's just a way of suggesting uh, to the operating system like, hey, I'm not doing anything super interesting right now. Uh, and uh, somebody else could uh, take charge of the CPU if we need. This really only makes sense if the expected waiting time is short. Uh, that is less than uh, we would expect for a couple of thread switches. Um, it also um, could indicate switching to a different thread in the hyper-threading mode or to uh, run the CPU in a low power mode because, uh, well, full effort is not needed for spinning on the spin lock. Uh, and using low power mode saves battery life. So why not? Why not do it? Or at least consumes less electricity save you some money. The only thing to note about the uh, compare and swap thing that is a slight problem is that um, if you read the same location twice, then you might think that nothing has changed. 
but that's not true because it's an ABA problem. Uh, that it, a value is or initially A has been changed to B and then is changed back to A, uh, and you don't necessarily want to just proceed as if it has always been A the whole time. It's changed to B might be important to you. Um, so you combat this by tagging, uh, which is you modify some value uh, with uh, a, a counter of some sort on each write. Uh, and this is how Java looks for concurrent modification exceptions uh, in a collection. Every time a collection is modified, you increment the count of the modifications, mod count. Uh, and while you are iterating over this collection, at the time that the iterator is created, it looks at the mod count and it remembers, okay, when I started the mod count was 7, uh, and if it sees that the mod count is no longer 7 for some reason, it says, oh no, you have changed the collection I'm iterating over, uh, and I therefore throw a, uh, a concurrent modification exception. You can keep uh, the value separately, uh, and you can compare and swap actually both of these things at the same time. Uh, if you if you have atomic support in your system uh, for something that is double the size of the lock, uh, so or, or at least the size of the lock and the uh, modification counter uh, at the same time, that's not too difficult. Uh, the ABA problem is incidentally not any sort of acronym or reference to ABBA. Um, that's, uh, you know, that would be convenient. Uh, I also understand uh, that they wore extremely fabulous outfits because uh, under Swedish tax law, uh, they could not uh, use the costumes as a business expense unless the costumes were uh, of a nature that could not be worn in the everyday. Uh, so you know, if they were going to appear in like regular suits and dresses, that wouldn't work because, of course, you could just wear those anytime you want. You know, wear them to a party, wear wear them to the opera, do whatever you want. Um, but uh, for tax reasons, they wore ridiculous costumes. Because sure, why not? Yep. Um, and so the ABA problem is a slight mess for uh, if you are trying to write a compare and swap routine because process 1 reads A and in the meantime process K interrupts uh, and stores the value of B and then another process puts A back again uh, and P1 resumes and it is a false positive compare and swap because it is expecting it to be the same even though it's not. If this matters to you, if all that matters is that the value was A and you're changing it to B, then sure, fine, whatever, you can you know, ignore this, but sometimes you care. Um, however, um, you know, the uh, usual scenario is that actually it might seem like a bad thing. Uh, and if you have a data structure that will be accessed by multiple threads, you might be controlling access to it with this compare and swap logic. Uh, and if you don't manage that correctly, you know, the algorithm should be retrying repeatedly until the data structure has not been modified in the meantime. Uh, and with a false positive, you get the impression that things didn't change even though they really did. Uh, and you might end up uh, inserting uh, some node in your linked list somewhere that isn't, uh, isn't in the right place. So you know, we talked about the uh, concurrent modification. Uh, exception. Uh, and uh, the things that I want to warn you about, about uh, the atomic operations is they're not magic. Atomic types just ensure that any individual read or write or read modify write operation happens atomically, uh, and you could still end up with race conditions or wrong answers if your threads are not properly coordinated. Um, and so you might have multiple threads that are trying to set a value of a variable, and you could have you know, the most recent value overwritten by a less recent value if you don't coordinate the threads properly that would still produce the wrong answer and it's not prevented by having uh, atomic operations. So they're not perfect. Ask your doctor if atomics are right for you. The other thing to note is that not every atomic operation is portable. Uh, depending on your system, uh, Rust may or may not 
have an implementation of an atomic type for that CPU architecture. Um, it tries its best, uh, and sometimes emulation is required to make it happen, so it takes what should be an atomic operation and actually uses locks to implement it because it's got no other way to do it. Um, and sometimes uh, an atomic type is implemented with a larger type, so if you are looking for an atomic 8-bit integer uh, and no such support exists on that system, it's actually going to get compiled to a, an atomic 32-bit integer, uh, and that is okay it gets you the correct code that you were looking for at the cost of wasting some space some platforms don't have atomic support at all so if you really truly need your code to be maximally portable you should be a little bit careful about what atomic types you plan to use <laughs>